Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's great to see a big crowd here today. I thought it was pretty loud. <laughs> Good morning and uh, welcome. I am Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today for the committee's oversight hearing on senior center model budgets. Senior centers funded by the Department of the Aging, also known as DIFTA, serve almost 30,000 seniors daily at 249 different sites. These senior centers play a vital role in the aging community. They provide seniors with meals, activities, health management resources, educational programming, and socialization. According to the National Council on Aging, seniors who attend senior centers experience improvements in their social, mental, and economic well-being. Study also show that seniors who attend senior centers can learn to manage and even postpone the beginning of chronic illness. Simply put, senior centers provide a host of benefits for our aging population. Thus, it is important that they receive the funding necessary to properly provide these services. Unfortunately, funding disparities exist across the city senior centers. Different senior centers receive different amount of funding and are reimbursed at different rates. Though the reason why is often unclear, to help address this inequity in funding, the City Council successfully fought for an additional $10 million as part of the fiscal year 2018 historic year of the seniors, $23 million increase. DIFTA and the Office of Management and Budget, also known as OMB, work together to create a model budget for senior centers to help DIFTA allocate these additional funds. DIFTA then compare each senior center's existing budgets to the model budget number to assess the senior center's need. Based on this assessment of need, DIFTA allocated the $10 million for a total of $20 million to senior centers to be used for direct staff and programming needs. Since then, DIFTA have made a commitment to add an additional $10 million to senior centers budget by fiscal year 2021. Now the committee now seeks to learn more about DIFTA's model budget process. While the committee applauds DIFTA work in developing a senior center model budget, we still have major concerns. After the release of the model budget, senior center's directors were furious that the model budget did not take care of meals, meal preparation, or kitchen staff. Many of their kitchen staff who work, who cook, and serve nutritious meal to hundreds of seniors every day have not received a raise in years and will now have to watch as some of their colleagues receive one. Unfortunately, this sends a message to them that they are not seen as a value member of the staff. Even though this administration had an opportunity to heed the concerns of the directors on the ground in the next budget, it decided to ignore our request to put a down payment on meal reimbursement. The committee is also concerned that senior centers and advocates were not involved with the model budget development process. In fact, DIFTA did not involve these individuals until about a month before the model budget was created. These important stakeholders could have served as an invaluable resource to DIFTA. So today we will hear from DIFTA advocates and other interested stakeholders about the Senior Center model budget. The committee seeks to learn about any other identifiable gaps in Senior Center funding that still exists after this model budget process and what must be done to help achieve parity between Senior Centers going forward. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing our policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, our counsel, Nusa Choudhury, and finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Dohini Sapora. 
And uh, other members of the committee will be joining us uh, soon. Now I would like to uh, add, ask our council to administer the oath to our first panel. Uh, commissioner, welcome, Donna Corrado. We also have uh, Sasha Fishman, the uh, Associate Commissioner for Fiscal Operation, and Michael Fosnick, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Planning and Technology. Thank you and welcome. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Uh, we also been joined by council member Rosendahl, who's visiting us. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Chin, members of the Aging Committee, advocates, partners, friends, and supporters, and DIFTA staff. I am Donna Corrado, Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, and I'm joined today by Michael Bosnick, Deputy Commissioner of the Division in Planning and Technology, and Sasha Fishman, our Associate Commissioner for Budget. I would like to thank, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the topic of Senior Center Model Budgets. As I mentioned in recent testimony before this committee during the fiscal year 19 preliminary and executive budget hearings, and in line with the administration's broader vision of promoting fairness and equity, the administration has added 10 million in new baseline funds for senior center portfolio starting in fiscal year 18, which will grow to 20 million by fiscal year 21. This represents a significant investment in DIFTA Senior Center Network. These funds were designated to help create parity in our senior center budgets and provide adequate funding to achieve and expand array, an array of programming across the senior center system. DIFTA and the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, will, with input from our network of providers and other stakeholders, conducted a thorough analysis of the existing line item budgets and spending patterns across our portfolio of 249 senior centers. As a result, we identified several characteristics that exemplify high quality programs, highlighting strong leadership and staff, as well as a rich array of health and educational programming. We then compared existing budgets to the funding patterns that support the key attributes of a high quality program and calculated the need for each center based on where their current budgets compared to this model. The key objective of the model budget has been to achieve a more equitable distribution of available funds among senior centers and in to ensure that every center has the funding they need to deliver high quality services. The model budget reflects that every center needs adequate funding to provide a threshold level of quality programming and to pay com competitive wages to attract and retain high quality staff. The network of 249 senior centers was divided into five groups based on an average daily participants. In recognition of the fact that there are certain costs that vary based on the size of the center, such as the need for modestly more staff to run a very large center compared to a very small one. At the same time, the model accounts for certain fixed costs for running a center, irrespective of the average daily participants. The resulting amounts given to each center were divided between an amount for program staff and another for programming based on each center's area of need. However, funding remained flexible across line items within certain parameters, thus allowing centers to identify their most critical needs and to submit proposals to DIFTA accordingly. In March, 223 senior centers were notified of the amounts they will receive for both fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19. All of the centers receiving this funding have submitted their proposals for use of the funds, and the contract amendment process is well underway. Depending on individual urgent needs, a number of centers propose to allocate a portion of their model <coughs> budget funds for purposes outside of the prescribed model. DIFTA assessed each of these requests on an individual basis 
to ensure providers had flexibility while still meeting the ultimate objectives of the model. Centers were also permitted to purpose one-time needs for the fiscal year 18 allocation. This was a thorough year-long process in which many of our external partners played an important role. Ultimately, we believe our mutual goal of equity was met and that the model budget funding will enhance the quality of our senior center programming. We are confident in the soundness of our formula and process and intend to implement a similar methodology for future right-sizing efforts. For instance, and as you know, the model does not address food costs. We are currently in the process of working on an evaluation of food services across all programs. This work is being done with the help of a consultant, and we anticipate this analysis will be completed later this year. Our goal for the second phase of the model is to evaluate how to achieve efficiencies in food procurement, preparation, and delivery while increasing quality and choice. I thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on senior center model budgets, and my colleagues and I are pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and we also have been joined by a committee member, Council Member Ayala. Welcome. Um, Commissioner, in terms of the model budget, in uh, a 2017 union settlement analysis found huge disparities um, in New York City senior center funding. In fact, their analysis found that in FY16, a senior center in Midwood, Brooklyn received uh, about $5.32 for each senior participant per day, while a center in Jamaica, Queens received about $50.31 uh, for each senior participant per day. So for the record, can you just explain why such a funding disparity exists? And then prior to the adoption of the senior center model budget, had DIFTA made any attempt uh, to address funding disparity across senior centers? So this whole exercise was, was about remediating that long-term um, inequity in senior center funding. Now there, you know, there are historical reasons why that happened. Um, the most evident one was uh, through the RFP process, we set certain threshold funding and then people and, and sponsors proposed a certain amount for, for funding and it was either approved or not approved. But more importantly, there were a number of centers that were not funded by DIFTA through the RFP process. And then subsequently, a council member would fund the center at a very low rate and then they would be baseline late in later years by DIFTA really just exacerbating the problem. So this was an attempt to look at senior centers across the board. Everybody, we, you know, we've always had the same expectations whether a center was well-funded or overfunded or, or not funded um, entirely. So with those expectations, it, it stands to reason that they should be adequately funding if we're going to hold them to the same accountability. Um, and have the same expectations. So this whole exercise was about um, really correcting that long-term inequity. Yeah, I know that in the last, um, definitely since the last session, um, the council was able to supplement a lot of the senior center who either overserve or they just didn't have enough budget. And hopefully with the model budget funding mm -hmm. that the council don't have to pick up what we call the senior center enhancement. So, um, so the, the, the senior center model budget provides a threshold of funding this, and the council monies that are added to that, what we, known as discretionary allocations, provide enhancements above and beyond that. So it was never meant to supplant what council is doing and if council continues to fund those enhancements, then more program and more enrichment will be had by the seniors. Um, but it certainly was not meant to supplant it. Well, I don't think we want it to theory. keep funding it, all right? It should be core, those are core services that we really feel that is the administration DIFTA's responsibility, and we are gonna continue um, to keep advocating for more, because right now, the budget for DIFTA uh, for our senior is still less than half a percent of the city's budget. And uh, we were hoping to get up to at least to one, but we're still only at half, so we're not done. Um, 
In your, your model budget, I know that in the uh, fiscal year, the, in the preliminary budget hearing, we did ask for the formula, and so we saw that you broke it down uh, to five groups. But why is there such a, um, a disparity and a gap between, you know, from one group to the other? Like the first um, block, the, uh, the difference was like 10,000, but then between the first and the second, uh, the difference was like 48,000. Okay. So Michael, um, our deputy commissioner, is going to answer that question because he really got into the weeds in terms of how um, they were stratified in different categories, but it was essentially based on average daily participants, but Michael can elaborate on that. Uh, correct. As you mentioned, um, we have five different categories uh, based on average daily participants. Uh, the middle category is the large category because most of our centers in terms of average daily participants group in an average size, a medium sized center. So that the centers that are the largest centers and the very smallest centers, there are small numbers of centers in each of those groups because they're kind of outliers in terms of our typical center. I did want to ask for clarification. When you mentioned 10,000 and 40,000, I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Um, that's from your recommended total for direct staff and programming. The first block was 195,424, uh, and then the second block was uh, 205,576. So between, yeah, it's different from the, the different blocks. Oh, for the average size of the budgets. Yeah. You know, that's right. And that is based on average daily to participants. We, um, the largest centers, as I mentioned, what we call block five, the largest group, um, there are only 12 of those centers. So they are just major outliers that, for the reasons that the commissioner mentioned, historically have gotten very, very uh, larger amounts of funding compared to other centers. Uh, be, and they do have large numbers of uh, participants showing up each day. So um, that accounts for the difference between the amount of baseline budget needed for the largest group compared to uh, the other groups. We tested to see that the outlying large centers and small centers were not out of range when you look at how much money is available per participant by standardizing the model to look at how many dollars are being given to a center to support each participant who's coming in. We felt that that was a good basic measure to look at variation from one center to another. And when you control for the size of, uh, for the number of people showing up each day, you'll see that those disparities in uh, average dollars per participant grow smaller. Um, and in fact, if you look at the largest centers, they have fewer dollars per participant on average simply because you have various economies of scale. So anyway, once you go get beyond the raw dollars to look at dollars per participant, uh, there you see clustering uh, in terms of how we're allocating dollars from uh, one center, between centers. But in, in this, the model budget, I mean, I think most of the centers were very happy because they got extra money. Mm -hmm. But there was a group, I think about 20 something, and most of them were large centers. They didn't get a dime. Mm -hmm. And they were not happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the centers that serves a large uh, population. So that there's no doubt that, you know, we have a number of centers that we consider outliers that are serving an extraordinary number of people and much of their, to begin with, they are very wonderful advocates, so they have um, a robust budget to begin with, but they did not get additional monies, and that's unfortunate because most of their costs are associated with food because that is really, you know, they're serving so many people. So that is something that we've looked at individually and will be addressing, but it was not part of the model senior center exercise, but it's something that we're aware of and something that we will work to to um, help help these centers. But it cannot be, you know, in, 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 all, um, in all fairness, it was not part of the model budget exercise, so it's not part of this budget amendment. But we do have to acknowledge that, you know, centers that overserve 
and where we can help fund them for the over-serving, we will do that, and we have done that in the past. We'll continue to advocate on their behalf. So how, so when, Tipton, when you, you mentioned over-served, so what is your, uh, how do you, what are you, your definition of over-served? What do you consider? So if we, for example, have a contract um, to serve 500,000 meals, and that's what if there's, you know, baseline funding is for 500,000 meals and they're serving 750,000, we need to cover their food costs. So where we can do that, we do, and we try very hard come at the end of the fiscal year to either add additional money to the budget um, to move money around with accruals to cover the costs of that food because they're overserved. So it's okay. on an individual contractual basis. Um, but there are certain centers and certain communities that are, are overflowing. Well, that's why the council, we asked the administration uh, for this year's budget mm -hmm. to at least put in $11.6 million to help supplement the food costs. And we call that universal free lunch for seniors because seniors have to, they ask to make a contribution, right? But in all of the centers uh, that I visited, the first line that you have to cross is to pay for the lunch to get your ticket. And I just got something in the email that one of my center is raising the cost from $1.50 to $2. Well, that's a bargain because in San Francisco, they ask for $5, a contribution. Well, that's the, San Francisco. You know, We're in New York City. And for the most part, you know, in all fairness, um, and we may agree to disagree, um, there are a number of centers, and I'll acknowledge that, where um, it really is um, a burden for a senior to give a contribution, and we acknowledge that, and we know where those centers are. But for the most part, and even in low-income areas, and I keep saying this, they're the most generous and they contribute the most. And in some areas with a you know, very high capita, um, they're less generous for a contribution. But the contribution, number one, is required with the Older Americans Act. We have no choice but to ask for a contribution, and we should be doing that in a way that you know, respects the person's dignity and anonymity. And I know we need to do a better job of that, and we've reminded program officers, we just went through this exercise about how they need to um, instruct programs to make sure that no one is being coerced in giving a contribution. But the contribution, in fact, is a very important piece. And, and for the most part, seniors do want to contribute to the cost of their meal. So other than for those seniors who are absolutely um, impoverished and suffering from food insecurity, uh, they, they really do want to contribute, whether it's 50 cents, whether it's a dollar or a dollar 50. So we need to collect that money so, and it also offsets the cost of the meal. So um, there's a variation, you know, and it varies from center to center. But I do agree that um, the centers need to be more conscious of respecting the person's dignity and making sure that they're not coerced. Because everyone is entitled to a meal. So universal free lunch is already in existence in, in essence. And they can contribute or not contribute. No one really knows, and we need to maintain the anonymity, but it is important for most people to contribute something. Yeah, we agree, but the way it is set up, uh, a lot of the centers, they have to collect that money to supplement their food budget. Uh, they do. And they're asked by DIFTA, and if the money goes down, they have to be accountable to DIFTA. DIFTA says, why, why, how come you're not collecting as much contribution? So I think that has to change we can ask seniors to contribute in a way that uh, they feel comfortable in doing mm -hmm. it, but right now, for a lot of center, it's the minute you walk in the door. And that's why we want it uh, to really help offset um, the cost of meal increase by asking the administration to put in the money for this year's budget. And, you know, at the last minute, mm -hmm. they, Right before we voted on the budget, they gave us $2.8 million for home deliver meal. Right. I'm grateful for that. But we asked for four, and um, there's still 7.6 that we've asked for for the congregate meal, 
and we're going to have to keep pushing for it because the model budget did not take care of the food. Right. It's so that is something that, you know, when OMB tells me, oh, it's going to be taken care of in the model budget, I was like, well, you didn't take care of it. Um, well, if they told you it was going to be taken care of in the model budget, I think that that was uh, factually incorrect. Um, but we are being taken care of in this phase two of this model budget process and this whole looking at food service in general and coming up with ways that we can um, increase the quality, the quantity, and also the, the amount of choice and accountability. And part of that is how we collect contributions, how we order food, um, and we can use some modern technologies to help advance that. So how soon uh, will you be able to finish that study? Or? Th that this study is, is ongoing, and it will be hopefully be finished um, by the end of the calendar year. End of the calendar, calendar year. Which end is of this year? By the first of the year, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to believe you, Commissioner. Maybe it's not DIFTA, but even with OMB, they drag their feet on this model budget. Uh, and it, so it's, it's almost it's the a, end of the fiscal year that the center is getting the It's a work in progress, but it is being done. We're going to keep on pushing. But I'm going to mm -hmm. uh, uh, ask my colleague to ask some questions, and I'll, I'll come back. Sure. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Commissioner, and to your staff for doing this work. I've, I'm not as involved as the Chair of Aging uh, City Council Member Chin is, so these might be some questions just to catch me up to what's going on. But I'm wondering, first of all, if when you did the model budgeting, if you felt, what was the, if you felt constrained by the $10 million allocation? In other words, when you did the model budgeting, what was the total need? And did it land over 10 million? And then I'm going to ask you, is that the reason why you took out the cost of food? Yeah. We took out the cost of food um, because we were doing that as a separate exercise, and we didn't want it to muddy the water. And we were really concentrating on um, improving the programming based on evidence-based programming that we wanted every center to have so that we can achieve certain outcomes. And also, we wanted to be able to recruit and retain staff. So that was our priorities, phase one. That's not to say that, the, you know, that we don't um, need to address the whole food issue. We do. It's a separate exercise. And we just didn't want to muddy the water, and it was a good start. Do you want to expand on that? Should I expand a bit? Yeah. Right. As the commissioner said, um, in order to make sure that... So, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. So, what's the total need when you did the analysis with the, um, you know, for, for a model budget, what, what did the total need come to? It came uh -huh. to $21 million right. less whatever the food cost thing is. $21 million Right, which, Less. which will be phased in over a period of time. Sorry, just stay with me. It's early in the morning. I had a 5 a.m. wake-up call this morning. So you did the model budgeting to do the experiential better budget, Correct. added up the difference between how much money they get now and what the new cost would be, and the, the delta between those two numbers not including food, was how much annually? 21, 21 million. million, which is magically very close to the $20 million that you have been allocated annually. Just noting that. Um, and then for the wage differences, in order to hire experienced people, does that involve contract negotiations at all, or are these all through the CBOs? just the choice of the director as to how much to pay people? So some agencies do have collective bargaining. Most of them do not. And we put in enough so that they can do and have the flexibility to either um, raise their staff, give them raises, um, or 
um, hire staff at a higher uh, starting salary. Are you assuming that mm -hmm. across the city, people with the same titles will be paid the same wages? I'm not assuming anything because if you look at what the contract titles are, are very different from what the agency titles are. Um, but essentially, within, a, within reason, I think that the job functioning um, tasks are the same and that they should be basically um, more equitable. So in your doing the analysis, did you equalize that? We gave them enough money to um, pay salaries which we thought were fair. But we didn't target into a particular dollar amount because it's not collective bargaining. And we don't control what sponsors pay their staff. We cannot do that. Um, and some of them do have collective bargaining issues. So we're working that on a case-by-case -case basis. Yep. And did you, um, could you identify for each of us council members the senior centers in our districts and w how much more funding they got and what in your, in, in doing the model budgeting, what that was intended to cover, whether it be programs that weren't provided or some sort of staff yes, allocation. Yes, we do have that else. level yes. of, of analysis and we'll be able to meet with you. You have that? Yes, we Committee do. The has it. Um, and did you do in that analysis any thought, any thinking about the food costs at all? Or is that an analysis you haven't done yet? It's an analysis that we're in the process of doing, but no, it is not included in the model senior center exercise, no. The reason I say that is because we can talk about it as an existential exercise, but at some point it turns into money in the budget, and I'm wondering if uh, when you plan to know what that cost would be so we can all get engage with you to make sure those costs are covered. So we are in the process of doing that, and we hope by the end of the calendar year that we will know better what that cost is and how also uh, we can realize more efficiencies to offset that cost and then what, what the difference will be. I'm sorry? So You're the, looking what for the net efficiencies cost would be. that may offset the, the cost of um, the actual cost of food for a, people? Of food service. We're looking at it in totality. We're not just looking at um, the food service workers, what their, what their hourly rate is, of course. We're looking on how we can modernize food service delivery altogether. So it's a it's much more comprehensive exercise than just looking at what to pay uh, the food service staff. Got it. So when you did the model budgeting, you took out the entire kitchen portion, staffing, the cost of food. We took out the cost of raw food and catering, and we did not account for an increase for the food service staff. And when, Correct. as you're thinking about it now, are you making accommodations for uh, religious differences? For example, centers uh, that serve all kosher meals. Our t intention is to expand the number of choices and the mechanism by which we serve food. So it's more, uh, basically more choice, more accountability, and a better experience for the consumer. Um, so um, with all due respect, I think what I'm saying is, and I appreciate the, the customer-centric language for sure, but for example, I have a, um, a senior center in my district that only serves kosher meals mm -hmm. and therefore requires certain accommodations in the kitchen. Um, I'm, not th I'm not sure they're looking for choice. They're looking for kosher meals 100%. Is mm -hmm. that something that would be accommodated? So we do have a, an accommodation for kosher meals, as you know, and, and they are uh, reimbursed at a higher rate than a, than a non-kosher meal. Okay. So, so that that's something that we've been doing historically for as long as I can remember. Okay. And then just specifically on your testimony, um, you said in March 223 senior centers were notified 
of the amounts they will receive. Is that the total number? Sorry, just out of, I'm almost done. Is that the total number of senior centers that exist, or is that? No, that, that's the, the number that will be getting an increase. Would any be getting decreases? No one is getting a decrease. Some did not get anything because they were at or above the model senior center. Got it. And threshold. how many did that total? You said 26? 26? 26. 26 centers. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Chair Chin. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Commissioner, um, will we be able to see the funding associated with the food analysis uh, to be included in the 2019 February financial plan? That's, that's ambitious because, as you know, that's when we'll be presenting it to the administration and to OMB, but I'm sure you can see a draft by then. So we got to get the money included. Otherwise, it's all talk because already the centers are suffering because they don't have money for the increased food costs. Um, and the administration didn't put in the money. I mean, I hope they will because so, they so took I'm they, I'm hoping uh, that everybody gets a meal and no one goes without. So if there is an individual center that's not able to serve food or pay their food bill, please see us um, because that should not happen. Yeah, because they overserve or the yes. meal costs, uh, because that's why we put in the request uh, in this fiscal year's budget. Mm -hmm. And somehow OMB didn't pay attention, didn't think it was serious. Um, but it, it's real. I mean, you have such a big gap between the meal costs. I mean, we were very reasonable. We were talking about a dollar increase, but they didn't hear the call. So we want to make sure at least get it in the February plan and so that we can prepare for the next fiscal year's budget when you're ready um, to deal with uh, the meal issue, that the centers can be fully funded. You know, I agree. But then one begs the question, why one center is paying $5.35 for a meal and another center from the same caterer serving the same meal is paying $8? So it requires further analysis um, in general and a further understanding of why those discrepancies are. Because and if you need yeah. additional staff to help, we are we're going with an outside consultant. So that's, I mean, we wanted to mm -hmm. get the information as quickly as possible so that mm -hmm. we can make sure that funding will be in place. Yes. Um, by the next fiscal year budget. I understand. Thank you. Um, uh, Council member Ayala, you have a question? I do. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, I guess my, my question is really around sal uh, salary uh, concerns that I have for the staff that work at these senior centers. And you mentioned that that was considered as part of the, uh, the, the formula used to determine how much was going to be allocated to each senior center. Um, when I worked in senior services, we didn't see a cost of living adjustment for many years. So I wonder, do you know when was the last time that a cost of living adjustment was made for uh, Staff at the so center? the cost of living adjustment is included in this last amendment. So in addition to the model senior center budget, it includes COLA and it, and it also includes um, increased to minimum wage. And how does that affect uh, additional funding for programmatic enhancements? It's it, a separate and apart. I mean, it's a separate line item but program enhancements are, are, will be added to the budgets as well. So it's one big amendment for the term of the contract. So it's um, accounted for in the out years as well. So is there, is there a concern? So, is, so they're separate and apart. So there wouldn't be a concern that uh, senior centers would use their discretion to then use a bulk of the money to increase salaries, considering the fact that many senior centers haven't seen an increase in such a long time. Most of the money is used to increase uh, our salaries, and it's in addition to cost of living adjustment and minimum wage increases, which are also being done at the same time, but it's in addition. I appreciate that. So, so it's a proposal, right? So they come back, and if money is um, intended for personnel, which we could 
we, we refer to as PS costs, that PS has to go up, and then programming also has to be enriched. So we look at how it's being spent, in addition to the COLA and the minimum wage increases as well. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, we also been joined by Council Member Williams, and he has a question for the Commission. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, we have uh, some issues that are very specific to uh, my district that I want to bring up, uh, so if, I th if that's all right. Um, and I thank you because I know we've had some conversations about it already. Uh, we were, uh, I had some active adults who were ready to shut some stuff down in City Hall, but based on some conversations uh, we've had, uh, the contingent is, is smaller, but here in any case. So I just want to ask them to stand in the back, please, all of the seniors from the Midwest Senior Center uh, in my district. Uh, in uh, full disclosure, because I had to disclose it on the record, uh, Midwest Senior Center is a great senior center with a great participant who happens to be my mother, uh, Patricia Williams, who's here as well. <laughs> um, and they were pretty rowdy. They were about to cause some, some, some rowdiness. Uh, but we, we have some concerns with Midwest Senior Center. Uh, for the past year, uh, my office has been uh, trying to work with uh, Millennial, who uh, is administrator of the Senior Center in the synagogue, you know the story, uh, to find a new place. We have been unable to do that. Now, there's a lot of finger pointing. But because we haven't been able to do that, these seniors are going to be without a home in just a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, and the response has been to send them to another location. They're not happy about that because they feel they're going to be split up and the relationships that they've uh, garnered are going to be broken up. And that, that will slow down the process of finding a new senior center within the vicinity which they live because most of them are most of the locations are several miles away. Um, we've tried to find a number of locations and we've had problems with that. Uh, so I'd like you to respond to that. There was something that happened this morning that was concerning um, as those members who decided to still come uh, join the bus. Some DIFTA people showed up trying to get them to go to another senior center. It seemed a little bit intimidating and so I just wanted to be concerned. I just wanted to ask the first question, why was DIFTA showing up uh, this morning when they never have showed up before. Right, so we, we've we had DIFTA staff there for a number of days trying to coordinate, um, at my request, a, a smooth transition during this, you know, unfortunate time that they are being evicted from their senior center. No, you know, nobody's fault here, no finger blaming. That was a court order that they have to leave the synagogue, unable to establish a new site um, before the eviction, so in, to make this transition as smooth as possible, we asked for the other centers to come in and transport seniors to centers and do basically open houses for the day so that they can senior center shop. Um, and it just so happened that our staff was there this morning and a bus um, was intending to take seniors to a different center to do a visit and then, um, unbeknownst to our program officer who was there, uh, a bus showed up to take the seniors to the city hall. Um, so the buses, you know, they thought were going to be filled up to go to a center for a site visit, was being another bus showed up in their place, and, and they were going to city hall. So the, the program officer was just a little surprised, and I'm sure she was encouraging people to go on the bus that would take them to an alternate site. So that's uh, just unfortunate timing. No, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't intentional or intended. We're Mom. trying, we're trying to, to have a very smooth transition. <laughs> At least that's what I'm being told. I wasn't there. M Ma, you, you, no. <laughs> I don't know. that. that. Y'all wonder where I get it from. <laughs> You, okay, okay Ma. so I wasn't Sorry. there, so if you want to, you know, <laughs> if you want to refute that, that's, that's what I was told this morning, because when I got the message that DIFTA staff were there trying to discourage seniors from coming to City Hall, I, I kind of scratched my head as well, saying, why would we do that? Um, because seniors can certainly um, do whatever it is that they want to do. It's a, you know, we encourage them to be advocates and and to do that. So um, I apologize on behalf of my staff if they discouraged you from doing what you need to do. Um, and that won't happen again. 
Thank you very much. Uh, apparently, there's differing opinions. I'm sure I'll okay. hear about later. Um, but if we can uh, also get to the meat of what's going on and how we're going to ensure that uh, not just these seniors, but all of the seniors who are right. home now will remain together even after, um, while we're trying to find a new location, one, and of course, trying to find a new location very quickly. Right. So we're working with Millennium, who's the sponsor on identifying a new location and obviously we have one under review currently um, and we're working with them. We have to do our due diligence, that's our job. So we will be working with them and doing what we hope, um, buying some time with their contract by keeping it open. Um, but what we can't do is if there's no services at a center and there's no site, we can't necessarily continue to pay staff uh, in perpetuity. So. We have to have a, a, a reasonable timeline in which to find a new location. And in the interim, um, and as you know, if they find a location, it needs to get not only DIFTA approval, um, but also needs to be renovated and make the accommodations for a senior center. So we're, we're, in the, we're in the process of doing that. We have identified a site. It's not ideal, in my opinion but it may have to be good enough and, and hopefully it will work out. I'm not gonna say one way or the other because it's still under review. And we'll try to expedite that um, renovation with, a, with a, a new landlord. But if it doesn't work out, we're gonna have to continue looking. Just to put uh, two things on the record, uh, I appreciate uh, the indulgence. One, uh, with the contract, because that was something that was strange. Um, we would, we've been trying to work this out for a year. We haven't, and then Millennium found out they wouldn't have the contract because they couldn't find a space that we feel we didn't get help to get. And so we're saying now that they will maintain the contract and funding for uh, at least uh, a couple of months, I guess, to try to uh, resolve this. And we're then gonna, second, are we gonna be able to, if we need to, if we find a temporary location that makes sense, have assistance so that they can remain together during the time? So period? we have seven other senior centers and options. Then none of them are ideal. They're not, your, not the center. Um, but they're in, in somewhat close proximity. And if seniors want to go together to those centers, I'm sure they'll be happy to accommodate them. Um, but that's the senior's choice. Uh, many, many seniors may feel comfortable in one center and not another center, but there are other options and we're really bending over backwards, working with those other senior centers to make those accommodations. And many of those other centers are significantly underutilized and would welcome new seniors, whether in a group or individually. So we do have other, other options. So setting up a temporary location, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, well so I mean, definitely, the, I mean, the, if the we find a temporary- The proposal was to set up a temporary location in an existing senior center, which is a great idea. Right? So if, if they want to all travel to a particular center, that's fine. But that does not mean that they're going to get um, double the funding. So I, I don't want to take time, so I just want to get the, the second part of it. I'll speak to you about this part uh, offline because some of those areas that you mentioned are far away. Right. And so that does cause a problem, and we're trying to keep them together. So mm -hmm. I'll talk to you about that after. I just want okay. to make sure I had it on the record. But in terms of the contract for Millennium, uh, that it sounds like they'll be able to extend at least for a little for, while while we're working. For a little while. Okay, what's a, little do we while. have a time frame? I have, we're, we're working with that on a month to month basis. On a month to month I can, basis. But I can't do that very long. If there's no, if there's no physical location, we can't necessarily pay them for a second. I, I appreciate it. I just want to put on a record that um, there's no physical location. We've been trying to get that for a year. So I don't want folks to be punished for something that is not their fault. And frankly, I'm not sure that DIFTA has helped expedite at, at this time. So I just want to make sure that's on the record. Uh, I want to thank uh, the chair for indulging me uh, at this time and thank my seniors uh, and active adults. I apologize. My active adults for coming out today and uh, for my mother uh, showing exactly where I get my fire from. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember William, and thank you, Mrs. William. And uh, we're going to work very hard. I mean, we should all work together. Um, if my office could be in assistance, we'll, we'll work together to make sure that the seniors are taken care of. And Councilmember William, I am surprised that you didn't talk to me about this early on. Mrs. William, you got to tell him. He didn't tell me that he was having a problem in his district. No, so at least we could have started working on it. So we got to remind him. We got to take care of home, home base. <laughs>
And we'll be joined by Council Member Drum. Welcome. Uh, our Finance Committee Chair, who uh, fought very hard for our budget this year. Thank you. Um, and we were just, before you got here, we were talking to the commissioner about getting uh, the money in the February plan so that we can take care of the food part that wasn't taken care of in the model budget. So we got to continue to work on that. Thank you. Um, and we've also been joined by Council Member Deutsch. Did anyone of you have questions for the commissioner? Uh, on the, oh, okay. Um, I think I have one final question about the, uh, the pay parity um, in the senior center. So what is the, uh, the salary range uh, of directors at the centers that's uh, operating uh, under DIFTA? So that's a loaded question. <laughs> that's the last time I... I mean, I I mean you to... have like a, guy, a guideline for them and also for directors who are bilingual, did that take that into consideration? So, I mean, does, so does I, DIFTA I, put out like at least a guideline for them? No, but when... when there's a, a proposal, uh, for example, about um, a particular staff, a, a program manager, for example, and it comes in too low, we will work with the agency and let them know that we're not necessarily pleased with that, that it's not equitable related to other senior centers, and we think that they should raise that salary. So we're doing it that way. Each individual sponsor sets their own salary scales, and some of them have union contracts, so it gets a little complicated. But, you know, my own personal philosophy is that we should be paying everybody more money. Um, so we try to push the envelope where we can. Well, that's why we were, you know, we wanted to push for more funding. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that the model budget process only 21 million, I think the probably could be much more than that to really have a fully uh, functioning, well-funded center. I think it's probably gonna go beyond that $21 million. Um, and then on the, uh, when you were talking about the COLA increase and the minimum increase that was in the amendment, but that did not include the food service worker, right? It did if it was a COLA and if it was a minimum wage increase, yes it did. So the two, so the food service worker got the minimum wage increase and COLA. Correct. Amended into the budget and in our years as well. Right. So is it effective in January? The new minimum wage increase is effective in January. Just for that. So it's not retroactive to 2017, July 1st, 2017. But since it's a three-year contract in the out years and next year, it was the minimum wage was amended commencing January 1st, 2019. But it's in this particular amendment. So they are going to get an increase. Ret retroactive? No, it's not retroactive. So they were supposed so to the get it starting wage, January of 2017? The minimum wage is going up January 2019. So what about the COLA, though? No. Not used to talking into microphone. The COLA will start in July? In July 2018. I, I just wanted to see if the, the uh, food service worker at the senior center, are they going to be getting any kind of increase? Yes, yes they did. They got, have gotten both COLA and minimum wage increases. But they will get it starting The COLA in is effective in July. The minimum wage increases are the next minimum wage increases are effective January first, so January first, two thousand eighteen. Yes. So they will get it in July for the cola, yes. in January for the minimum wage increase. But right now they didn't get anything, because they were not included in the model budget. Uh, they have gotten cola and minimum wage increases this current fiscal year as well and fiscal year 17. It's an ongoing process. It started with going up from uh, to $12, then to $13.50, then $15, 2%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.5%, 2.
on each salary in between. So they've been uh, continuously getting at them uh, as well as other center staff. And so they, that is, it just happens to be included in the same amendment, but that has nothing to do with model budget. Okay, so they still didn't get anything in the model budget, but they will get for whatever they are entitled to in terms of COLA and minimum yeah, wage correct. increase. Okay, all right. Um, do we have Councilmember Deutsch? Okay, oh, question. I'll, I just have a few comments. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our chair for her advocacy uh, over the budget, um, fighting for our senior population. It's really a, an honor for me uh, to work with our chair and the, our, my colleagues in the aging committee over the last uh, four and a half years. And I want to thank you, Commissioner, for everything that you do. And I just want to remind um, our senior population that uh, today is the first day of the summer season. And I was to remind you, I, don't, I actually don't have to remind you because um, today I think it's in the 80s, but we're going to have a hot summer. So um, just to remind you to look out for those cooling centers. And if you don't have the air conditioner at home, please do not hesitate to um, reach out to your elected officials to use their offices at a as a cooling center and as well as, you know, keep staying cool throughout the summer. So unfortunately, every year we hear, we, we hear of some tragedies, so it's important to, uh, to remind you of that and always check on your neighbors, the elderly and disabled neighbors. In addition to that, I'm proud that I was able to uh, advocate with the Parks Department to put Moby mats uh, at the beachfront along with my colleague, um, Councilmember Mark Traeger, to have Moby mats throughout the Coney Island uh, beach so this way, the, a Moby mat is a hard plastic tarp that lays from the boardwalk to the water. So, because it's very difficult for uh, seniors, people with disabilities, or even a parent pushing a carriage, a stroller, to get in, in, to get to the beach, to the waterfront, and enjoy the, the beautiful outdoors and the recreation space. So, if you have a Moby mat, it gives you easy access to go from the boardwalk to to the water. So. Please utilize it. You have them throughout the Coney Island Beach. So if you ever want to go out and just cool off, uh, don't hesitate to come into our district. And if you need transportation, don't hesitate to contact your local elected official to get transportation uh, wherever you live to, um, to go to enjoy the beautiful outdoors. So once again, I want to thank our chair for everything that she does and uh, all my colleagues, the members of the committee, and most importantly, I want to thank all our seniors who take of their time to come out to these hearings and let their voices uh, be heard, and you have loud voices, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Council Member Deutsch, and thank you for your service to your senior in your district. They're lucky in your district. They get to go to log trips. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, one last question is that, um, in this whole process with, uh, you know, getting the, the, the food service, uh, the meals correctly, are you, can we get DIFTA to commit to engaging the provider as early as possible? Uh, because with the model budget, they were sort of brought in, and even some of the centers was brought Absolutely. in very, very late. Absolutely, and they've, they've, we've already brought them in in the initial uh, phases of this analysis, and we will continue to do that. You have my word. Because we wanted to get this process out as soon as possible. Um, I think, uh, oh, okay. I know I want to let you go so that you can go watch your dad. Well, your dad is not performing, your uncle is. Uh, at a senior center, they're putting on a show for the commissioner. Um, so, in terms of the uh, the model budget process, are all the senior center, the 249, are they all done? Have you have they did all the amendment for them? We have an update. So thus far, all the model budget proposals have been received from providers, I mean the providers gave them back to DIFTA, and of those budgets, 176 have been approved by DIFTA, and 50 others are in the final negotiations and revisions, 
And while negotiations are finalized, if there's amended all model budgets for fiscal year 18 and 19, and as we mentioned, these amendments have been combined with 12-month contract extensions, cost of living adjustments, and minimum wage adjustments. And DIFT is working to expedite the registration so that as many as possibly will be registered by July 31st when the last invoice for fiscal year 18 is due. And regardless of when each contract registration is completed, all budgets will be retroactive to July 1st, 2017, so that the full 10 million can be utilized by the centers. And I want to give a special shout out for our Associate Commissioner of Budgets, Sasha Fishman, who has been working nights and weekends um, to do this with her staff, and they've been working uh, nonstop. So we really uh, need to give them a, a round of applause, I think. That's right, that's right, no noise. <laughs> and I mean that literally. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sasha. Uh, so out of all those centers, uh, how many centers did request uh, funding to be used for other purposes? Do we have any idea? A f only few requested, as far as we know, to use the funding for food and uh, maybe kitchen staff. And some requested uh, use funding for emergency one-time uh, needs. Uh, some requested more funding uh, to be used for personnel than, than programming, than what we originally allocated. We've approved most of the increases, or we had worked uh, with the program to make changes to the proposal so that uh, the budget can cover both the increases for food staff as well as uh, uh, the model budget portion. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank you again, Commissioner, for your partnership. And going forward, we will continue to make sure that every year is the year of the senior. Okay? So thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy your show, and say hello to your dad for us. So we're going to call up the, uh, the next panel. Andrea Siafani from Live On New York. Uh, Kevin Douglas from UNH, United Neighborhood Houses, and Michelle Jackson from Human Service Council, and Chris Wadello from AARP. You may begin. Good morning, Chairperson Chin and the Committee on Aging. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to testify about the DIFTA model budget. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Human Services Council, a membership association uh, comprised of about 170 human service organizations and coalitions across New York City. I am not a DIFTA expert. Uh, you'll hear from people much smarter than me about the model budget and senior centers today. Uh, I'm opening things up to just provide a little bit of context about the sector overall and how all the coalitions have come together to really advocate for increased funding and process changes to make the human services sector stronger and better able to deliver quality services. So decades of underfunding have really stripped the sector of the ability to provide quality services and have left a lot of se the sector really wondering about their financial stability. And as you've already explained today, that is definitely true of the senior centers and other senior providers. About 20% of human service providers in New York City are insolvent based on their books, and over half report that they don't believe that they'll be able to meet need. Yeah, their increasing need in future years. And so we've done a lot of work in this area and have come together with, with what a group called the, 
the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group that's comprised of a lot of the major coalitions in New York City, including Live On and United Neighborhood Houses and others, and to really come together and talk about how we need to lift up the sector. Uh, and how we got to this place is not a new, <laughs> it's not a new problem. It's really decades of underfunding, kind of process changes that actually start really at the RFP process. Uh, the RFPs are not designed with providers at the table and people who have an expertise um, to talk about what's working on the ground and what isn't, what are real rates for food or other um, costs, and how those costs go up. So a lot of RFPs are coming out and have come out uh, that don't cover the full cost of services, and nonprofits are asked to make up the difference. The next step is there's rising costs. A lot of these contracts last for five or five years or longer, and Often it lasts beyond the duration of the contract initially because it takes a while for the RFPs to go out, so providers are asked to extend their contracts, and rent and other things in New York City go up every year, and the contracts don't reflect, and there's not really a vehicle for those uh, increased costs to be reflected. So by the, by the time you get to the end of a contract term, the gap in funding has just increased. Then you add process issues like late, late registration. The controller's recent report, report you know, shows how bad uh, late contracting and late pay, which therefore means late payment, is in the human services sector. This creates real cash flow issues for nonprofits, and also um, it, it can, can cost them money too, right? So some of them take out lines of credit and things like that. Uh, both the administration and the council have really tackled these issues, so I want to make sure we point that out. Um, DIFTA actually had a roundtable with some of our providers yesterday to talk about contracting issues and how they can, how we can be better understand each other and partner together. And the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has made a lot of really great inroads into process changes and changing, including making a RFP collaboration um, or more collaborative, <laughs> um, which is really important, I think needs to be noted. And of course, with the council's support last year, we were able to obtain uh, the model budget as well as COLA and increased indirect funding. So those are all really important steps. But we are seeing, particularly the model budget, we were excited to see that this was an opportunity to address contract by contract. Every contract's uniquely underfunded, but I can guarantee that they're all underfunded. <laughs> and so the model budget was an opportunity to address that um, and to get at some of these chronic underfunding issues. And as Council Member Chin has already pointed out, there are issues with the DIFTA model budget as well as others. I'd like to point that ACS's model budget providers and coalition groups have said that that one went pretty well, and so I think there's a model that could be used in future years if this is something that continues. We did not advocate in this budget year for more increased funding for model budget because the process was convoluted and didn't feel that it addressed a lot of the chronic issues that you'll hear from other providers today who can definitely give a little bit more color to that. So going forward, first to address the late registration issue, we're asking for a SWAT team to be put into the city agencies to clean up all of these delays in, in registration. We're end, nearing the end of the year. This also includes all of the amendments for the COLA indirect and model budgets. We have about 10 days left in, in this fiscal, <coughs> fiscal year, and a lot of those registrations, while now that they're sitting either with the controller's office or the city agencies, are not registered yet, and that needs to be fixed. We're also looking for in this funding year, although it was not included in the budget, uh, while it was included in the council, council's response, though, was we need to see increased funding for occupancy costs, for fringe rates for providers. We need to continue to see increases in indirect rates. And then there needs to be some of these larger systemic issues that are addressed through process changes at, at the city agencies to make sure that late payments and RFPs that go out in future years are actually meeting the needs of, of providers and the people that they serve. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Andrea Chanfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. Live On New York's members provide community-based services to over 300,000 older, older New Yorkers annually. Many of them are here today and you'll hear from a little later. Um, senior centers, we know, are the keystone to DIFTA's ser senior service portfolio. As mentioned, and we want to be clear, um, and you mentioned it, um, Councilmember Chin, in your opening remarks, senior centers are not just nice to have. Uh, research shows they are the link to combating social isolation, improving health, and keeping um, older adults engaged in communities. That's why we were very encouraged and applauded Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Corrado, and her team, and the City Council, led by Councilmember Chin and the Aging Committee last year, for the $23 million investment, including funding for model senior center budgets. Again, you'll hear directly from some providers with context on this process, but we just wanted to highlight a few of the overarching um, um, issues and, and highlights from, from the past year. Um, you heard from um, the DIFTA team earlier today that um, as of today, 
that FY18 funding, again, very close to the end of, end of the fiscal year, is not fully registered into all the senior center co contracts. So that's a, that's a growing concern. Um, providers were not engaged in the process until late March, so that's a little bit um, you know, understandable with the timeline. And again, all of that said, we do really do want to, to recognize the work of the DIFTA fiscal staff to make this happen in this condensed timeline. Um, it's a lot of work, and we do want to help get that money out the door. Um, but you know, again, they're not registered yet, and, and we're really concerned about the um, programs getting the funding. Um, we did talk about the 249 senior centers that were analyzed. There were 26 out of those 249 that did not receive any funding because they were deemed at or above the model budget amount. Um, we have, um, it's based on our understanding, there is some other centers that are outside of that universe. There are about 38 programs that were not even evaluated in the model budget process, which we have some concerns and questions about. Some of those, I believe about 11 centers were formerly um, discretionary funded centers that were brought into the DIFTA portfolio. So we have some concerns about them um, being evaluated and included in this process. Um, as noted today, the funding was to be only directed in two specific areas, um, important areas, but directed to direct staffing and programming. Um, despite the fact, we talked a lot about meals, despite the fact that senior, cer senior centers served over 7.6 million year meals last year, with the majority of seniors using these programs saying this food makes up over half of their nutritional intake, half of their daily intake of food. Um, providers could not use the funding from meals or kitchen staff, which has caused disparity among programs, and these are some of the most highly valued and important members of the senior center team. So again, that was a concern. This also means that um, no centers, even those who receive funding, received anything for rent and facility costs, transportation, OTPS, technology, technology or any other costs required to run a senior center. Um, I also did want to note that the city has um, promised an additional 10 million for this process by 2021. Um, all of that being said, we have some recommendations, um, again, to work together with both the council and DIFTA and the city on this. We, we see this as a great first step and really want to be collaborative in this effort because we know the value of investing in senior services. So I'll just run through those very quickly. Um, the first is to expedite the additional 10 million promised um, as soon as possible in FY19. With the RFP for senior centers anticipated um, in the near future, and, um, we see no reason for the city to hold this funding, um, and we'd really like to get that out before 2021. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier in your remarks, and I know that um, the city is working on the meal study. So in the meantime, um, we are very encouraged that the city is working on looking at meals. They're a core component of senior centers, including home delivered meals as well. Um, but we know that the city is spending 20% below the national average on senior meals, which means they're paying for four out of every five meals and providers are picking up the cost. Um, we did ask for funding and advocate for funding in our More Than a Meal campaign in FY19, um, which in itself was just a first step to support providers while we wait for um, the work of the meals um, program to continue. So we really would like to focus and, and encourage um, funding added as soon as possible to support higher costs of pro um, providing meals, including kosher, halal, and other culturally competent meals. Third, um, we're encouraged to hear again about the meal study, but we really hope that um, the city will continue to engage providers directly in this process. Um, providers have a lot of context and can really provide a lot of input to help um, improve these programs and make sure they're effective, and so we're having really meaningful conversations about the funding that will come, because there is a budget implication of what will come from that study, and we want to make sure that it's reflective of the true needs of the system today and in the future. Um, Fourth, um, in general, fully fund senior center contracts. Um, we talked about the other items that were not included in the model budget, and those really need to be addressed and looked at um, as we move forward. Uh, fifth, we'd really like to make sure that the city is taking a look at those programs that were excluded from the model budget process entirely. Um, those, many of those are centers that are held to same standards, and um, if the purpose to, was to right size contracts and promote fairness, we'd like to make sure that those are addressed accordingly. Uh, finally, we'd like to um, echo Michelle's comments on supporting the agency-wide investments in the human services sector. Uh, we really believe and we see it every day that our aging services system is at its best when professionals are using the people power to serve older New Yorkers instead of navigating contractual bureaucracy or, or wondering when the funding is coming in for the work that they've already done. So we are, um, support HSC's um, asks for the investments in the human service sector. And we work, really look forward to working with the city on, on those issues. I wanted to close 
with um, one of the quotes from our postcard campaign. We ran a postcard campaign this year um, where we had thousands of seniors who sent postcards to many of your offices. I'm sure you got stacks of them, as well as to the mayor, to really talk about why New York is a great place to age. And we believe that, and we look forward to working with you all to make it better. And I think this quote really kind of sums up most of the seniors that responded to that campaign talked about their senior center, and it's why we're here today. Um, and this is just one that really, I think, illustrates the value of what we're investing in when we talk about investing in senior services. Um, a senior from Speaker Johnson's district um, who visits Project Find said this, centers should be open so that seniors can have a meal, meet other people, including seniors. The centers offer internet access to look for jobs and activities to keep up with friends. The center also offers a sense of community and belonging. Psychologically interacting with other people helps stave off depression and suicide. Centers offer opportunity to keep learning, keep the brain active, making new little brain cells. It's important to have a safe, clean place to go, just like boys and girls clubs. Seniors are just big kids, essentially. And we, we really believe that um, older New Yorkers are driving the city forward, and we want to continue to support um, senior services. And we look forward to working with you all to do that, to make New York a better place to age. Thank you. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> So good afternoon, or good morning, I, I suppose. Uh, my name is Kevin Douglas. I am the co-director of policy and advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses of New York. I want to first uh, thank and recognize you, Chair Chin, for your fearless leadership for many years for the older adults in New York City that led to actually the investment that we saw in the model budget for older adults. And obviously also want to thank Councilmember Ayala for your leadership on the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, Chair Drum uh, for the Finance Committee leadership that led to the inclusion of home delivered meals in partnership with Chin, and also Council Mayor Traeger, who's been a real supporter for older adults and immigrants here in the city. So overall, we're very pleased that the administration made a really historic commitment to investing in the senior center system and DIFT at large, because that hasn't been done in a real way for a long time. And so I want to preface everything else I'm about to say with that acknowledgement and appreciation to the city. There were a number of problems with the model budget process that we think are important to discuss so that when we move forward, we can do things in a uh, more strategic way. The first really relates to the question that Councilmember Rosenthal asked about when DIFT embarked on this process, did they do an analysis of what the entire need was gonna be for the model budget process, what those resources were gonna be, and then what that meant given that there was only $10 million on the table. I share her surprise uh, that the total amount of need to right size the system was the exact amount that the city had committed to the process. Um, I think really what we expected was a $10 million investment was not enough to right size a senior center system of 250 roughly providers that were serving thousands of older adults every year. So out of the gate, we knew that we were sort of behind the eight ball, that there wasn't gonna be enough to actually do a model budget process. And I think the model budget terminology actually led to some of the uh, frustration in the field because the term model budget implies a good standard, right? Like we're doing a comprehensive look at all of the elements of a program and creating a budget that should be emulated and is fully funded. And instead what we saw was a very piecemeal approach that was underfunded and slow without transparency. So what we actually wound up with uh, were enhancements to senior centers, which are welcome and appreciated as you mentioned, um, but it wasn't a model budget. And so that was the first thing that we were really concerned about. Uh, we echo uh, Andrea and, and Michelle's request to expedite the additional $10 million because we know those are at a minimum required to do this right. Uh, we'd asked for it to be done in this fiscal year and we're disappointed it was not. We still call for the administration to invest those funds. Moving past the sort of question of money because you know we always uh, want more resources and the city's gonna be able to commit, the process itself was significantly flawed. Uh, there was a real lack of transparency throughout this process. Uh, neither providers or the associations that represent them were engaged over the course of the year in a meaningful way to get feedback with this universe of dollars, what is the best thing we can do? And it really wasn't until March, as, as the commissioner testified to, that providers were told how much money they had and what the eligible uses of those would be. So we were three quarters of the way into the fiscal year before anyone really knew what was happening. Uh, DIFT has talked about this sort of five buckets of providers, we still don't know what the methodology was, we don't know what the funding levels are, and as you attested to with uh, the union settlement report, providers don't understand why they got the amount of money they got, particularly if they have more than one center or discrepancy between the two. So we're really disappointed that there wasn't a back and forth with the field to really understand this. And as Michelle talked about, in the ACS prevented budget uh, 
model's budget, there was over 10 meetings uh, with providers to understand what their needs were and how to use the funding effectively. As a, in addition with several of us up here, the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group, to talk about the process. So assuming that we get the additional $10 million the city is committed, we'd really encourage DIFTA to work more closely with both you and uh, providers and um, associations to really make sure the funding is used correctly. Um, moving forward beyond sort of process, beyond sort of transparency, was the actual lack of flexibility. So we knew because there wasn't enough money that they weren't gonna be able to do all elements of the model budget. And it was really frustrating that the food costs were left out. Uh, we've heard from the minute this became public that food costs were not gonna be allowed. Our providers were like up in arms and like wanting us to be up in arms with the city about this because that was what they thought was gonna be one of the most significant needs for their centers. Um, you had asked how many providers actually requested uh, to do food costs and, and the city correctly answered only a few. What they didn't say is that only a few did because when the process was launched, they were told they couldn't ask for it. And it wasn't until around April where they issued a clarification in partnership with OMB to say, actually, you can ask for it, but only if you meet this like super high threshold. And the threshold was only for new uh, expanded programming or significant changes, not to rectify existing underpaid staff or underfunded uh, meal programs. So it, just want to note that there was a much greater need for the uh, investment in food services than was reflected by formal request because of the signals that were sent to providers. Um, so the last thing I, I'm just really going to echo Michelle as well. Part of, this is not all on DIFTA, right? So there are significant problems with human services contracts across the board. So it was very hard to do a model process on top of a system that was not working to begin with. So we really echo the call to make sure that the city is doing a better job to bring all contracts up to fair indirect rates of at least 15%, bringing the fringe rate up at, to at least 37%, making sure there's increases for occupancy and insurance. And when you have that baseline, then you can build a model budget on top of that, presuming that you actually put the full amount of money in there. So again, you know, this is sort of a, a critical analysis of, of the process, which we think is important, but just, I'll end with sort of a note of appreciation again because this doesn't negate the fact that the dollars were, in the end of the day, an enhancement that the centers did make use of and are grateful for. And this is really coming from the spirit of let's figure out how we do this better moving forward, building on examples that ACS and other city agencies took. So thank you. Good morning, Councilwoman Chin, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Chris Widello. I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York. And um, thank you to the members of the council that are also here to hear our testimony. Uh, I represent uh, uh, 800,000 uh, AARP members that are in the five boroughs, and I'm really happy that a number of our members and volunteers were able to join me here today for an important uh, uh, discussion about model senior centers. Uh, I guess the bad part about going last is everybody took all the good stuff. So um, I certainly want to echo all the points made by my colleagues to my left. And uh, this is a, you know, really appreciate that OMB and DIFTA and, and the administration have taken this approach, but we need to get it right. And uh, also make sure that, you know, that these costs that senior centers are forced to, uh, you know, deal with on a regular basis are, are part of this conversation. Otherwise, um, down the road, we are going to have some some serious uh, problems, and I, I'll sort of reiterate some stats that you've heard from me a number of times. And you know, expediting that next ten million dollars is is incre incredibly important. Um, in a budget that rivals that of you know thirty six other states in size, it's hard to believe that the DIFTA budget is less than a half per half a percent. And we know a few things, right? And I, I know Council Member Ballone is fond of this, that every day, and it will happen for the next 10 years, 10,000 people are going to turn 65 years of age in this country. This is a huge group of folks that is um, that are uh, going to be needing services that are provided by DIFTA. Now, it's not just here in New York City, that's across the country, but you can kind of figure out what that looks like. It's something around, I believe, I did some math, it's ballpark about 500 people a day here in New York. Um, so one, nearly one third of residents in the five boroughs are, the, are of age 50 or older, and that group is expected to grow by nearly 20% by the year 2040. And that growth rate for the 65 plus uh, group, the segment is projected to be even more dramatic, a whopping 40% increase. And these folks, uh, right, if, if senior centers are struggling now with the current budget or will have issues with this model budget, that 
problem is going to be exacerbated and we have to uh, get ahead of it and get it right. And so I think uh, we appreciate all the well intentions uh, moving forward with this process, but I think my colleagues have really laid it out uh, th that we, there are some uh, things that are left out that are inc incredibly important and need to be addressed and, you know, at the, at the very least we need to, um, you know, expedite the funding so our centers can do what they need to do. And I, I think I'll keep my uh, comments short because I think it's important that we hear from some of the providers that are on the front line and handle these issues every day and uh, understand what this means from their perspective. So uh, thank you to the council for uh, this opportunity. Yes, thank you so much for your testimony. We've been joined by Council Member Traeger and Council Member Valo. Um, all your recommendations are great and we really have to get this process started early with the, the, the food, uh, the meal part that was not included. I, I didn't hear from the commissioner, the 10 million or the 20 million, it was just a down payment. That was not the amount that we were talking about. I think to really create a model budget for our senior center, you are talking about maybe adding $100 million. Uh, so we just have to keep on pushing and fighting that whatever the administration put in is great, but it's only a down payment. And it is an investment because our seniors, the seniors that go to the senior center, they're so much stronger and healthier and seniors are part of our future. We didn't even talk about all the contributions that they make to keep the city running and going, the volunteer service. So it's not just that they need help. They are also providing the help. They're the caregivers. So I think this investment, we just got to keep on pushing and, and make sure that everyone feels proud. If you get to be a senior, it's a blessing, right? So I'm so proud to be a senior. <laughs> So we got to keep on doing that and make sure that the administration get the point and we're going to push o OMB to work with the providers to really look at this meal program. And hopefully we can get some money in the February plan before the next budget. So thank you to this panel and thank you for all the great advocacy that you do. Thank you. We're going to call up the next panel. Katie Foley from Self-Help Community Services. Uh, Pauline Ain from uh, CBC Open Door Senior Center. Jonah uh, Gensler from Sunnyside Community Services. And Aaron Rooney from Stanley Isaac Neighborhood Center. I just want to thank all the AARP member for joining us this morning. It's great to see you all the red. <laughs> you. Okay, please start. Hello, my name is Katie Foley and I am the director of- Make sure you press the button. See the red? Yes. It is red. Is this, is this better? Hello, my name is Katie Foley. I'm the Director of Public Affairs at Self-Help Community Services. Thank you again to Committee Chair Chin and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify about the city's model budget process for DIFTA contracted senior centers. Four of Self-Help's five senior centers were included in this process, and my remarks today are focused on our experiences with those four contracts. First, we want to commend the Department for the Aging the OMB and the City Council for the ongoing commitment to senior centers since the beginning of the model budget process. This significant funding for the city's senior centers has been and will continue to be a critical step towards stabilizing one of the core programs that supports older New Yorkers, including many immigrant seniors. Overall, our experience with the model budget process has been positive. The additional funding has allowed for numerous upgrades for self-help senior centers. First, the investment enabled us to raise salaries for program staff, which was much needed and much appreciated. 
The investment in the model budget for staff helped us address ongoing concerns related to salary parity that we heard about today, and that has been a concern for self-help and we know other providers and advocates since the case management salaries were raised. We've now seen the impact of increased salaries in the aging network, and we're grateful for this important step. Second, the additional funding allows us to expand programming options. And third, the flexibility provided in the fiscal 18 budget offered the opportunity to upgrade centers through one-time purchases, such as repairing the entryway at one center, purchasing computers, and large kitchen equipment for other centers. We are finding that some spending, especially related to building repairs, is difficult to achieve in the short time frame since we received the funds. But we are optimistic that DIFTA's flexibility will extend to allowing some of the projects approved for fiscal 18 to be completed within fiscal year 19. And our relationship with DIFTA is stronger because of our work together in implementing the model budget process, and we want to thank them for that collaborative relationship. In addition <clears throat> to the success of the model budget process, I want to share some of the challenges that we faced. We remain concerned that other costs beyond programming and related salaries were not included in this process, particularly food and kitchen staff, both, both of which are significant costs for senior centers. We hope that the allocations in the subsequent years will focus on food, rent, OTPS, and other associated costs. Self-help supports the request for $12.1 million for congregate and home-delivered meals to be baseline to increase the reimbursement rates. We also appreciate the $2.8 million in one-time funding for home-delivered meals, and we hope to see continued investment in food and meals in the future. This funding is particularly important to increase the reimbursement rate for culturally competent meals, such as kosher or halal, both of which currently result in a deficit to nonprofits upon each meal provided, despite cultural competency being a requirement of DIFTA. Given our interactions to date, we believe that DIFTA will continue to engage with providers on necessary budget modifications, considering the dynamic needs of each center. Self-help is requesting that the remaining $10 million that's been committed to this process be allocated in fiscal year 20 instead of fiscal year 21, expediting the $10 million in funding by fiscal year 20 as opposed to the proposed three-year rollout will have a very positive impact on the operations of our programs. Allocating these funds is especially important with the projected next RFP for senior centers to be released in calendar year 2020. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of the 20,000 clients that we serve, I am grateful for the council's support on our many important programs. Good morning, our lovely, you know, and uh, chairperson, Mark Lee Chen, and uh, members of the city council. First of all, I, on behalf of the Chinese American Planning Council Open Door, really say thank you, thank you, all the city council really strongly support the senior. But one thing I'm very exciting because our lovely chairperson, Margaret Chen, always said that, you know, the year of the 2018 is the year of the senior. And also give us the additional money and the $10 million for model budget for senior. Our senior very, very exciting. We thinking about open door is really under the department for the agent 46 years already. We are the huge run senior services. We provide a very great services for the low income, for the immigrant, for, you know, and, uh, and the uh, Chinese uh, Asian American senior. Everyone happy, happy our services. So I thinking about this additional money, open door, maybe get a, some money, not a lot. But unfortunately, we cannot even get one dime of the budget. So that's why all our seniors are very disappointed. We are not jealous the people get more money, but we are very disappointed we don't get any money. Because we service 
provide very good quantity and quality services for the senior. But a lot of people don't understand how we run the very good program. The one thing, you know, we thank you, the department for the agent, we don't complain. They should understand. We run the great program, it's not that easy. The one thing we're concerning about the staffing, about the services, about the money and whatever. But the point is, I'm talking about the facilities. The, because right now, we are very happy we locate at the 168 Grand Street, very good facility. But unfortunately, they not allow us to put the kitchen over there. We should call the other side. Even they said that the congregate meal, that's the really congregate meal. No, congregate and the catering should be over there. But the department for the agent only give us the congregate. I get a sample, sometimes the holiday is different. One fifth, our kitchen area, they close the door. But our center should keep the door open. Where we cook the food? Where we cook the food? You think we close the door, don't provide the food for the senior? Definitely unfair. So we try to call the, uh, the uh, catering food from the restaurant, but the department for the agent did not approve the money. They said that you had the kitchen. Why you don't cook by yourself? Why you call catering the food from the restaurant? My friend, could you help me? You're so smart, I'm not smart. Could you help me if the kitchen closed? How we cook the food? We, we don't want to keep our senior hungry. So as the director so order the lunch from the restaurant, that is come for the catering. So the department for the agent not approved, where I get the money to feed the senior? That's the one problem. The second is, before the department for the agent title five, give us nine senior aid to help our kitchen staff, the custodian and doorman, a lot of things. But right now the department for the agent title five, they said that they facing the budget problem. They only give us one senior aid. Even not one cine, only 12 hours away. So that's why <coughs> we're facing about the staff shortage. The department for the agent said that they cannot give us money to hire the staff whatever we want. So right now, I have some staff, how to they get paid? They said that, that's the director's problem. You should fundraise the money to pay the staff. My goodness, you thinking about the director is a super lady? No, if you don't give us the money for the catering, you don't give us enough money for the staff and always say that that's the Directors should resolve the problem. The third, we had our staff, most of them are minimum salary, only thirteen fifty. But I tell you true, my some kitchen staff worked in my center forty two years. You know how much money she get? Only thirteen fifty. The new person come in, they get the thirteen fifty. 
So that's why they always jump up to me, pulling. That's unfair. Why we were over there 42 years, still get the 1350, but the pu new person come in, get the 1350. So this the other problem. The third thing, the, our call should be bilingual, bicultural, and also very smart. How to write the manual, how to know, uh, how to control the budget, how to marketing, how to do this thing and that thing, and also the timing. Because the food, hard food should keep hard, cold food should keep cold. I talk too much, but I really thank you, city council person, you so smart. Yesterday, I joined with the one very Asian American Business Development Center fundraising. They invite me to go over there. One person asked me, Pauline, could you share with me why you that successful? Sharing with me your secret. I said that. Very easy. You should have a good heart, good mind, not only good heart. You should know how to plan, how to get the money, how to do anything, and return and provide very good services. Not only that, and good mouth too. So that's why today I had a good mouth and raising my voice and let everyone know I am not a super lady. So that's why please give me more money. Don't isolate of us. That's really, really insulting of the open door. All our staff were really hard over uh, utilization, but the money, nothing. So I tell you too, our lovely chair, you know open door very well. When you visit open door, you see how upset their face. Not only that, our staff too. Because I, if you want me sharing with you all the things, I will. Yeah. But the other thing, talking about meals on wheels. Well, Pauline, I... A lot thing, I know you know very well. Yeah, I think for, I thank we you for the, we your over, testimony. Over I think it's important to hear directly from the center. And that's why we have talked to DIFTA about the 26th center that did not get a dime from this model budget. So we are going to make sure that there are enhancement and supplemental funding that can help you. Okay, so we will follow up uh, yeah, thank on you. your case. <laughs> All right, next. Thank, thank you, Polly. Good afternoon. I'm Jonah Gensler. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Community Services at Sunnyside Community Services. And I speak on behalf of our organization, which serves 14,000 individuals throughout Sunnyside and all of Western Queens, and our executive, Judy Zangwill. So we're one of the organizations that did receive funds. We received about 2% increase. I agree with um, the remarks that this is, in fact, an enhancement. It is not a model budget. Um, and so we do have concerns. At the same time, we're grateful. We're grateful for a number of things that come from both council such as geriatric mental health, which has really completed our center. Thank you, Con um, Councilman Ayala. And we're grateful for indirect rates that have increased, um, for recognition of minimum wage increase needs, um, and for this model budget. Our organization has a wide spectrum of services, not just a senior center. We've got case management, geriatric mental health, we caregiving supports on multiple fronts, social adult day, home care, and it's, we're proud of this integrated service platform. And our senior center, our senior center is, is our, our shining program that everybody knows. 2% is not a model budget. So when the model budget 
was in the works, we waited. And when months went by, we waited. And by March, we figured this is going to be really good. We were underwhelmed. The instructions that we got said to us, this is for programs, direct program staff. We said, great. And they gave examples, including a bookkeeper. So we said, surely our cook and our assistant cook, who serve 200 people a day with a team of volunteers under them, surely they will be included in this. The instructions didn't say otherwise. So we put forward that that was soundly rejected. We asked for a logic, we, we asked for explanation. We didn't get that. Now I will note that finally we were able to work behind the scenes and achieve what we wanted, which is simply to move funds into those two positions which are critical. But making a deal on the side is not the way to do business. And not having that documented and not having the trust of what will happen a year from now when the other monies kick in and how those resources will be used leaves us feeling uneasy. So when we look at partnership with DIPTA, and we do see leadership and program officers who are good, thoughtful people, but engaged in a process that doesn't make sense, we ask, how can we be partners with council and with DIFTA to build a true model budget and model true leadership for the seniors that so much deserve every ounce, every inch of our best planning and thoughts and work to the deliver the services that they need and deserve. Thank you all for your attention and your continued support of seniors throughout New York City. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the City Council and um, Committee Chair Chin uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Aaron Rooney. I'm the clinical director at Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center. Uh, I oversee our case management program um, and clinical services there. Um, I also thank the council and DIFTA for the investment um, in the model budget process. Uh, it's a promising first step in bringing these vital programs up to date. Uh, the additional funding allocated to our center will assist us to partially fund a new social work staff. Uh, this is crucial. We see over 700 clients a year for case assistance and case management. Uh, we need to build towards a staffing pattern that can uh, meet these complex needs. Uh, there do remain some issues with the model budget that are not addressed, as we've been talking about today. Um, some of these areas um, include the food cost being excluded from the model budget. Uh, providing nutritious meals is at the core of the services we provide to senior centers and older adults to keep them healthy and safely in the community. Uh, the model budget does not address increased costs for food. It also doesn't include additional costs it would take to provide therapeutic meals um, and meals that are tailored to individuals based on um, actual medical needs and individual needs. Uh, that's something that we care about and somewhere where I think we should be going in the future. Um, it also is noted the model budget does not include um, enough for staff wage increases that we've been discussing. Uh, the ability to keep wages um, high or, or at a higher rate as a direct impact on the quality of services that we can provide and how long we can keep good staff. Um, I think senior centers are a great um, entry level position for a lot of social workers and for case workers, but keeping good staff for long term um, is, is a big issue uh, that we see at our center um, as well. Uh, the coal increases alone aren't, enough, aren't gonna be enough to do that. Um, in addition, it's been difficult to ascertain where each center stands in the process. Um, it's known many negotiations are complete, others are not. Um, with the end of the fiscal year uh, approaching or is here, uh, which requires more transparency in this process would be benefit everyone. Uh, the model budget has been instrumental in helping senior centers catch up to where they should be in 2018, uh, but has thus far fallen short of preparing senior centers for the future. Uh, as we grow older together, additional thought and investment to senior centers will be essential to assure these vital institutions can meet the unique, changing, and growing needs of older adults in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time today to come and give testimony. 
we're going to continue to work with DEFTA and make sure that we get um, the funding out the door and make sure that we get more money uh, for our center. So thank you. We're going to call up the, uh, the next panel. Uh, Aria Saransky from UJA Federation. Rachel Sherrill from City Meals on Wheels. Uh, Colleen Cohen from CP, uh, Chinese American Planning Council. Jeanette Estima from uh, FBWA. Molly Krakowski from JASA. Okay. Rima Jassen from PSS. Oh, okay. I think they submitted testimony on the record. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Chin and Councilmember Ayala. Uh, my name is Ariel Sobransky, and I am an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on senior center model budget processes. Um, also, thank you for your continued and necessary support for Department for the Aging Core Services and Initiatives in the FY19 budget. However, outstanding issues prompted by the senior central model budget process remain. We would like to submit the following recommendations and requests, and many of these have been discussed previously, so I will just quickly echo what my colleagues who came before me have said. Um, so after months of delays, DIFTA is in the process of dispersing the first $10 million installment. This funding meant for FY 2018 and still not fully registered across all senior center contracts can only be used for direct staffing, programming, and consultants. We appreciate efforts to right-size senior center budgets, particularly when it will bolster staff salaries and help implement high-quality programming. However, as was discussed previously, these funds do not cover the full cost of services, specifically meals and kitchen staff, transportation technology, rent utilities and insurance, and other miscellaneous costs. Additionally, we had advocated for the expedited release of the remaining $10 million that was promised through the model budget and an expanded definition for what this funding can be used for. This request was not considered in the FY 2019 enacted budget. The next projected RFP for senior centers is set to be re released in 2020, and it is extremely important that these funds are committed prior to this RFP so that future awards account for the full cost of running a successful senior center. Um, just going to briefly touch on senior center meals. So while food insecurity rates among most New Yorkers have actually declined in recent years, rates among seniors uh, have increased. As UJA Federation's network of nonprofit partners provides vital food services and supports to all New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs, this is something that we're extremely concerned with. Um, access to culturally appropriate meals for older adults at senior centers is paramount to this effort. While well, we appreciate the $2.8 million that was included in one-time funding for home-delivered meals in the FY19 budget, this is well short of the $12.1 million we had requested and does not apply to meals actually served at senior centers, which further widens the gap between reimbursement and cost for meals in the centers. Um, lastly, I would just like to echo what some of my colleagues have said about the nonprofit sector as a whole. Um, as representatives of the human services sector, we are disappointed that the FY19 budget uh, did not contain the needed investments that we had advocate, advocated for. Um, organizations accept city contracts at great risk to their stability, but they do so because they are mission driven and want to ensure that New Yorkers receive quality services. Nonprofits cannot continue to operate without crucial investments and systems changes, and this budget does not include the commitments necessary for a robust human services delivery network. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we look forward to working together throughout this year. Um, thank you, Chair Chin, for your consistent and dogged support of aging services and for the opportunity to speak. My name is Rachel Sherrill. I'm the Associate Executive Director at City Meals on Meals. I do not want to be redundant. I want to start by saying that I love the timer, so anytime you want to bring that back, um, <laughs> anytime. Um, so I'm going to be really quick. The uh, model senior, the 
senior center model budget did not include food. Everybody keeps talking about it. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, components of senior centers. So without that, I, I'm just not sure how we're going to get to a number um, that is realistic and viable for our centers. As my colleagues keep reiterating, the contracts are not fully funded to begin with, so not having this as part of it is really makes it much more difficult. The other piece I just want to um, uh, again, emphasize is that we really need to expedite this $10 million to happen in this current fiscal year. We cannot wait another year. Um, we just have to keep fighting for more, but we really need to push this out for this fiscal year. So thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful summer. Good morning. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you very much, Chair Chen, for the opportunity to testify and for your persistent leadership on these issues. My colleague, Po Ling, Ng has already said uh, many of the issues better than I possibly could have, so I'll keep this brief so we can all get to lunch. Um, but I do want to highlight a couple of recommendations that CPC has to improve the model budget process overall. Um, in the next phase, we urge the increased transparency and providers' role in implementation. Had providers been more intensely involved in the creation of the model budget and implementation, we would have been able to say that our kitchen and security colleagues are essential to the operations and that they need to be included, that the model budget cannot be successful without fully including meals. Um, and so we hope to have the opportunity to weigh in on these issues as providers are the ones that are delivering the services on a daily basis. And we understand most how to make sure that all of the pieces are addressed throughout the model budget process. The next recommendation we have is making sure that we address the insufficient funding and exclusion on some of the centers. CPC has three senior services centers, two of which were included in the process. Um, we urge the expedition of additional funding by 2020 for providers since we have not necessarily received all of the first wave um, and the price of food, of transportation, of rent, of other OTPS expenses continue to increase, it's urgent that we expedite this funding in order for it to be meaningful to providers. Thank you so much for your work on this, for your persistence on this, and for the opportunity to testify today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeanette Estima, and I'm a senior policy analyst at FPWA. Thank you, Chairperson Chin and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, last year, Mayor de Blasio acknowledged the importance of senior centers as community resources by committing to the creation of this model budget. And while we're grateful to the administration and, of course, to the council under your leadership, uh, we're disappointed in the process and ultimately with a model budget that still leaves most centers with large funding gaps. However, we are pleased to hear that the administration has heard some of these concerns and is planning to meet with advocates to discuss these following issues. Uh, regarding the process, it could have been improved uh, in two important ways. Uh, first, by increasing the uh, transparency in the process and, of course, by being finalized in time to be implemented in FY18, which was the year in which the initial funding was allocated. As DIFTA and OMB created a methodology and considered the goals of the model budget, providers were not consulted or invited to give feedback. We understand this to be in sharp contrast with the process at ACS, which included focus groups with frontline staff and incorporated input from providers into its final recommendations. We believe that had providers been a part of the DIFTA process, the issues with the budget outlined today could have been avoided. The timing of the process has also been very slow, as you've heard. Today, with the close of FY18 just days away, many senior center contracts have not yet been amended and registered. While we recognize the hard work of the DIFTA fiscal staff, we are still concerned about these delays and urge the administration to ensure that there is adequate capacity at DIFTA to process these amendments promptly. Um, finally, the model budget is currently set to be implemented by FY21, but this prolongs the time that some centers must function without the funding that DIFTA itself has determined is needed for baseline operations and it puts them at a disadvantage when it comes time to compete for the next RFP set for 2020. Given the chronic underfunding of senior centers, this funding really should be implemented immediately. As for the model budget itself, the $20 million uh, allocated simply doesn't cover the full costs of baseline operations. Three major, major categories of senior center expenditures were not considered for correction through this process, food, occupancy costs, and OTPS. 
Uh, we know that senior centers play an important role in reducing food insecurity among older adults, which is why meals are a fundamental service that they provide. A model budget that, ex that excludes meals is quite simply incomplete. Um, even the funding for direct staff, as you've heard, is incomplete because it doesn't include kitchen or meal staff, leaving centers scrambling to supplement their budgets to pay for the full staffing costs. While we understand that these costs can vary widely, they are clearly critical to operating a senior center and should be accounted for in the model budget in some way. Uh, finally, uh, as you know, 38 sites were wholly excluded from the process, including 11 centers that were formerly funded by discretionary dollars but have since been baselined and are subject to the same requirements and standards as other DIFTA centers. Um, while we understand that the social clubs and some other sites that offer only a few programs are not full-fledged senior centers and have very different budgets, they should be evaluated as well in order to determine whether or not they are also funded at adequate levels. Therefore, FPWA urges DIFTA, OMB, and the administration to reconsider this model budget to include all core expenses. This means additional funding to address insufficient reimbursement rates for meals, adequate staffing beyond program staff, and to include the centers that were excluded from the process. And of course, we also um, support our colleagues at HSC and uh, the other advocates that have spoken today towards um, a, an overall investment in uh, human service organizations around indirect infringe rates. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We also have been uh, joined by uh, Council Member Matthew Eugene. Um, thank you to this panel, to all your advocacy work. Uh, we totally agree with you. Uh, so the, the next budget process has already started for next year's uh, the, for FY20. We are not going to give up, and we're just not going to take what they gave us this year. I mean, at the very end, they put in 2.8 for home deliver meal, because they had to do something. Um, but that's not enough. It's not sufficient. And um, we want to make sure that we get this model budget, so-called model budget, down packed before the next request for proposal so that we can make sure that all our centers are adequately funded. So we're going to continue to ask for your help and support with this process, and we're going to engage OMB and DIFTA um, continuously to make sure we get it right. So thank you again for being here and, and for your great work. Is there anyone else that wanted to testify that didn't fill out a slip? Council Member Ayala, thank you for being here. Uh, okay, so thank you everyone for coming today and our hearing is adjourned. <laughs>